Um, by way of introduction, David uh, has a PhD from the University of Southampton. Um, he has published widely and his work focuses on the use of large scale and long term data sets on the distribution and abundance of species in order to understand and predict the effects of environmental change on biodiversity. And his current focus of, uh, of, of this research is predicting the biological impact of climate change. Um, and of course, this is where citizen science comes in. Um, David uh, heads up the Biological Record Center, the BRC, which is based in the UK. He's been in that position since 2010. He's also been involved as coordinator of the uh, European Union FP6 project, which delivers uh, delivered alien invasive species in inventories for Europe. Um, he also continues to lead the United Kingdom Center for Ecology and Hydrology contribution to the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. And uh, it seems that butterflies and moths are your one of your particular uh, particular research interests and particularly from a taxonomy point of view. Um, he's also been involved in research on farm scale effects of herbicide tolerant genetically modified crops and uh, has also been involved in research on the uh, research on the ecology of urban ecosystems. Uh, the BRC has supported the collection and use of wildlife sightings for more than half a century and the core of uh, the BRC's work has remained broadly unchanged throughout its history. David will be sharing with us this evening how the BRC has expanded to embrace citizen science and to develop innovative approaches for the capture and use of biodiversity data. David, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much for agreeing to share with us about your work. And uh, it's very good to have you with us this evening. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that very nice introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I had a very nice trip to South Africa a year ago last November. Um, I met Les, had a nice chat about citizen science and the things we were up to and share some similar experiences. So I'm really glad to be able to uh, talk to you this evening. And um, I've uh, I've been following some of your citizen science hours and I've been hugely impressed with the diversity of, of activities and the talks you've had. So hopefully uh, you'll enjoy what I'm going to share tonight. So I'll share screen now. Thank, Thank you. you again. Yeah, so I'm going to, so obviously with 50 years of history, I'm trying, I will have to be very selective, but I want to give you an overview of the sort of past emphasis of BRC, what we're doing presently and some things that we're starting to develop as a sort of future um, direction for what we're doing. So this um, diagram is, I'll come back to this, but this is a sort of tree of recording schemes that we work with in terms of taxonomy taxonomic scope and the the circles around this tree are where groups for which we formally published a distribution atlas and the the double circles are where we've produced more than more than one um, which is um, clearly very valuable for understanding change and distributions but before I do that I just wanted to rather than get straight to the um, technical slides I thought I'd share with you some some European landscapes um, borrowing some photos from my colleague Chris Francois who I work with quite a lot on uh, butterfly monitoring work across Europe. So this is a nice alpine meadow with traditional grazing and traditional um, housing. There's issues of abandon abandonment of these sort of um, traditional habitats that's affecting biodiversity. Um, this is a, I think it's an Eastern European scene which is quite typical, these sort of um, expansive um, mixed uh, landscapes of tree cover versus open habitats. Uh, moving more, more northerly, northern Europe, we have these sort of uh, classic slow rivers, often heavily managed or manipulated to control uh, flow of water and often with impacts of um, nitrogen pollution in terms of eutrophication of, of river systems. And unfortunately, this is a sort of common scene in uh, much of northern, particularly northwestern Europe, very intensive landscapes of, um, in this case, improved grassland to support grazing animals, for example, um, and also sort of cropped um, arable habitats, also very extensive. 
and this sort of final one before we get into talk about BSCs. This, this, so we're sort of working in this landscape of very uh, human modified with a mix of sort of arable, urban, um, and remnants of semi natural habitat in the same sort of environment. So, citizen science is incredibly important uh, because people are living in these places and want to contribute to the understanding of biodiversity and improve their own uh, well being as well as the environment the improvement of the environment. So BRC is, is within the UK um, and is really, I guess its remit is the fact that there's, you know, it's a diverse landscape in terms of habitats and pressures causing um, impacts on biodiversity. BRC uh, uh, was formed in the 1960s and the remit has been really to support biological recording across as many taxon groups for which people are interested in contributing records. So we, we as part of our 50th anniversary, we published a, um, a journal special issue and uh, a sort of leaflet a brochure which describes um, how BRC has developed since the 1960s and the themes that we've been tackling in terms of supporting recording, but also using that data to understand where species occur, the threats they're under and how they might be changing. So this comes back, so this figure shows the tree of recording schemes that we work with, uh, where we have a formal um, sort of partner organization who ha has a special interest in particular uh, species groups. So these vary hugely in their size and capacity. So some are, are big organizations that employ staff, uh, manage data, um, do their own analysis, etc. Whereas others will be one or two key naturalists who are interested in a particular group. So we we try and support all of them, and what they need from us varies greatly. But I think the strength of what we do is that we can take a, a relatively broad view across biodiversity. Um, so we're not dependent on perhaps some of the more characteristic, char charismatic, or popular groups. Um, so we predominantly cover terrestrial and freshwater environments. We do a little bit of marine, the marine environment. And we do relatively little on birds because there's there's big organisations such as the British Trust for Ornithology who um, sort of coordinate a lot of activity um, nowadays. But we often work with them on research projects. So this these national recording schemes and societies that, um, as we term them, are effectively are really the the sort of bedrock of what BRC does. So BRC itself sits within a research organization. So uh, we would only be able to do what we do by having these uh, strong partnerships with national recording schemes who each of them provides a focus for a particular species group, be that the Dragonfly Society, uh, Butterfly Conservation, um, or the, the Weevil Recording Scheme, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's around 83 of them that we formally recognise, and what they do, as well as supporting volunteers themselves, is they collate records, often from multiple sources, um, uh, often online nowadays from various sources. But they provide a, a review of that data, and we work with them to manage it to make it available for, for research. We also, alongside that, have uh, around eight. Uh, what we call stru more structured schemes, where the, this is uh, schemes where it's a more directed protocol to typically revisit the same site year on year and through the year and to typically count the abundance of taxa. So these schemes ask more of participants, but uh, they're, all they're all citizen science based, but they often have a dedicated professional support um, person to look after them. And the data is in some ways much richer because it's uh, we understand more about the effort involved in recording and uh, the locations are fixed through time. So these schemes exist for uh, butterflies, moths, uh, pollinating insects, uh, vascular plants, uh, birds and uh, um, some of the reptile and amphibian groups. And one of the, the other thing on this figure on the right shows the uh, accumulation of uh, books or distribution atlases. So BRC's 
certainly if in its earlier period was was very focused on uh, bringing together data and information to publish in in atlases in books and uh this is this is a recent one that we've been working with on on moths so about 500 pages dedicated to the uk's moths and what these and we're still very keen on these sort of project-based outputs producing these atlases they often go together with an online uh, version but they're very important for bringing together a community and giving a focus to recording um, they often try and cover the whole of the uk and all the species within that group so they give a a sort of time stamped um, consistent picture of the distribution of a group and how it's changed which can be incredibly valuable for um, various research uses so the uh, these recording schemes are cover a wide range of groups and yeah i don't think brc could couldn't really do what it does without these strong partnerships and these are often run by volunteers themselves, highly expert volunteers. So that, that was a sort of past and future and present view that that will remain our core part of what we do. But in terms of the, the sort of present focus of what we're doing is to, is to try and make um, mo most use of that, that huge accumulation of data that's been built up over 50 years from recording schemes to support various outputs and various research applications of the data. So sort of headline figures that we've been working to develop and apply st statistical methods for um, dealing with the data that are coming through biological recording. As you might expect, it's highly concentrated in particular geographic areas. It varies over time. Um, involves lots of people with different levels of expertise. So it's quite a challenge um, extracting an understanding of how distributions have changed over time. But we've, we have some techniques that we um, have confidence in and are being used quite widely for um, understanding which groups are changing um, and, and what the factors causing change are. And we're also embarking on a, a piece of work to uh, take a, uh, a wholesale approach to modeling the distribution of species. So looking, uh, predicting spatially where species will occur to support a range of applications um, to do with um, understanding hotspots of biodiversity and particularly informing where restoration um, activities may be best placed, for example, if you want to protect or restore certain types of communities. But this is all done within a framework that we we're trying to develop around thinking about the whole life cycle of uh, of data from the capture of observations to bringing that together in a harmonized way where we uh, have it in a common format and have some understanding of um, uh, the, the quality. So having some um, assessment of the data, uh, then moving on to producing modeled outputs as data products from the raw data because we we feel a lot of the applications probably want to work with a modeled view of the data rather than um, have the, the problem of dealing with the raw observations and then focus them on various outputs to do with changes in biodiversity and the distribution of species and within that sort of workflow is a set of activities that um, BRC is involved in. So we do support the capture of raw data through online systems. We use a system um, built on some software tools called Indicia and iRecord is our um, system to support UK recording. But we also pull in data from uh, many other data sources online and, and offline. Within the data processing, we're trying to comply to FAIR data principles, so repeatability in what we're doing in terms of um, how we've treated data so we can trace the outputs back to the raw data and developing open tools for, for the community to use that data. Packages in R, for example, um, to provide tools for analysing the data. And on the right-hand side is the sorts of outputs that we're, we're then producing. Again, making these data available openly for others to use them for research. 
So I'm going to expand on a few of these uh, points within within what we're doing. So I so uh, our online activities under the iRecord system, I guess, common with many online systems across the world. We are seeing, you know, it's it's a very good way for us to engage new audiences, um, to increase the flow of records, and to make the flow of records more uh, uh, rapid to the end users. And um, so this is some infographics that one of my colleagues produced to sort of summarize this sort of growth. And where we've seen most growth is actually where the species group has a mobile application focused on that group to support recording. So that's both to capture the, to enable people to submit data, but also provides information such as guide, guide information to support identification, et cetera. So the two going together allow us to widen our audience of contributors. And we also have a, a system that um, for, for the review of the data we have, where we have good engagement from experts. And we take more of the, the approach of wisdom in the crowd, as I describe it, where we nominate um, experts who review the data rather than more crowdsourced ways of um, sort of wisdom of the crowd type approaches. So I think both have huge value. But just for um, practical reasons, we've gone with a sort of wisdom in the crowd approach. And we've had good take up from our experts in contributing to that. And the end result of all that effort is, is ultimately informing um, government and researchers about the status of biodiversity. So I mentioned we've been developing statistical methods to extract um, trends in individual species and then combine them into indicators of change. So this is a relatively simple figure showing um, the blue line, which is the average trend in occupancy since the 80s with a measure of uncertainty. But behind there is a huge effort in terms of recording over a long time period from very expert people affiliated with uh, um, um, non-governmental organizations. Um, one of the two of the recording schemes that I mentioned, the Hoverfly recording scheme and the Bees, Wasps and Ants recording society. So they support the recording of this data. Then we work with them to analyze the data and bring together plots such as this, which is a, a summary of 356 bee and hoverfly species. So it's the sort of average status of that group of pollinating insects. This uses one of the government's um, measures of progress towards biodiversity. Um, and many of them show the similar picture that um, a decline uh, since the 1980s. Um, and some of them so, show some evidence of recovery, but I think it shows the importance of citizen science contributing to uh, the way that government measures its progress in terms of biodiversity targets. And as well as these applied governmental applications, clearly as a research organization, we're interested in um, supporting the research community to, to use this data to understand environmental change. Um, and the other feature of BRC that it's, the, the, the sort of environmental challenge that we've been working on varies, uh, has varied a lot through the through the period. So in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there was, it was, I guess it was mostly focused on red listing um, and understanding threatened species. And then we've moved on to tackle issues such as climate change, invasive species, um, sustainable agriculture and food security. And more recently, uh, pollination has been a, uh, a key focus of a lot of our work. Um, so this shows us some of the examples of what we've done or the wider research community have done using this data. And just to illustrate this in a bit more detail as a, as a sort of case study of, a, of one species, the sorts of data that we um, have worked with the recording schemes to bring together, in this case, butterfly conservation, um, a big NGO in the UK. So this map shows for the brown argus, Ericea agestis, um, the distribution in the first atlas period. So the data was brought together over that period of 70, 1970 to 1982 to show the occurrences of this species at a 10 kilometer grid scale resolution. And if we sort of move on to a period of um, just, well, actually the third atlas, but it shows 
um, in orange areas that were colonized or the butterfly was recorded from um, in the latter period where it wasn't known previously. And we have good coverage in the UK. So we know, we were pretty confident that these were new colonizations. Um, and this expansion has continued. And detailed research shows that it's, you know, there's a strong climate change signal in this. We've seen a lot of species expanding poleward through the UK, particularly insects that benefit from the warmer conditions. But there was some very detailed work to look at trying to understand this expansion in a bit more detail. So the figure now, the map shown on the right, shows the red and blue dots. So the red are um, where the, the insect, the butterfly was feeding on rock rows um, as its food plant. And the blue, bluer color is where the populations were growing on geranium as a food plant. And the dark and light show the known um, populations in the earlier period versus the late period. And the basic message is that the, the historic populations were very much restricted to sites where rock rose was growing. These are chalk and limestone sites. Um, and the, the blue geranium sites are where the species has expanded onto um, average farmland sites, road verges, um, other sort of general um, vegetated um, sites, much more, much, much wider, much more widely distributed types of environments. So what the, the re research show behind this is that the, although there was a climate change signal, what, what effectively the signal was is that climate allowed, a warmer climate allowed the species to exploit a much wider set of food plants. So it facilitated um, and a range expansion. So the link between um, food plants and climate was established. And then further work um, by a research group in Bristol showed that there was a genetic component to this. So as, as the butterfly moved onto a different food plant, it then had a preference for that food plant when it was given a choice in lab experiments. So there's a sort of an evolutionary response going on. And the final bit of the, the investigation of this species was to look at uh, it's um, parasites that were were um, affecting the the larvae of this species, and what it showed is the the figure shows the observed parasitism was much higher on the established populations than the new populations. So the range expansion was also facilitated by the the butterfly escaping from its enemies. So they had fewer. Um, Paras parasitism and mortality in the in the new part of the range. So the parasites may well catch up, but there's a, I guess it illustrates that there's a there's detailed um, detailed stories behind these range expansions that may superficially look like purely climate driven, but there's a whole range of other factors um, amongst there. So I feel that gives you a flavour of um, the past and. Um, some of the research use of the data. There's a lot more detail in um, the booklet we published around our 50th anniversary that's available on the BRC website. But I guess I've sort of hinted that a feature of BRC really is, is over, yeah, I totted this up, it's over 57 years now since it was first established, is this Lewis Carroll figure of the Red Queen um, from Alice Through the Looking Glass, where you really have we have to keep running to do to keep the same to keep the same activity we need to keep developing keep looking for new ideas um and if we want to move into new areas we have to go twice as far so that's been a story of what brc has done is that we've we've tried to continually adapt to the the latest environmental issues and um how the community were moving and citizen science has been a uh so BRC, when it was established in the 60s, the term hadn't really been invented, um, but it, it describes well some of the activities we do. So we've been working in citizen science um, to position, to understand how it's developing and how we can contribute. And what this figure shows is a piece of work that my colleague, Michael Pocock, undertook, where he did a review of environmental citizen science across the globe. 
Um, it was published in 2017, so, so it went up to about 2015, I'm sure. If we did this again, there'd be lo lots more studies to, to look at. But he basically scored them all by a number of um, categories and then produces ordination and looked how the, the types of citizen science has changed over time. And what we've seen is a, um, early so examples of citizen science were relatively simple. Um, we, we, we saw that a tendency for projects to become more elaborate in terms of asking more of participants. And then more latterly into the um, post 2010, we've seen a movement more towards mass participation and often more simple protocols again. And we think this is, well, the other signal from the paper is that a lot of this change was driven by the use of new technologies to support citizen science. It's perhaps not surprising, but a nice way to have it visualized. So in terms of the future for us is that we're clearly we've used, technology has been a huge feature of BRC throughout its existence, be that mechanical plotters in the night to plot a map, which took a day to produce a map in the 1960s and 70s, but now using um, online technologies. So this shows an example where we're developing mobile apps to lower the barriers to people participating. So this is aimed at farmers actually, where they would take a series of photos from their field, then shown on the left, and they'd give some information about what they'd sown in the field margin. Then the a computer, a computer vision algorithm would give a classification of those species and be very open about how reliable it was and what species it expected to, um, uh, it thought it recognized. And then given that list of, of plant species within a, say a field margin, we would then give a report on the likely pollinating insects that could be supported by that, that flower resource. So it's a way of um, farmers understanding the value of what they're doing to support pollinating insects, for example. So I guess our emphasis is trying to put some ecology into these tools. And the second uh, one I wanted to mention, um, I could probably give a whole talk on butterfly monitoring in Europe and pollinator monitoring in Europe, but we've been working on uh, a project over the last couple of years to, to again, produce tools that allow us to, again, lower the barrier to collection of data, but also to collect data that's, we have more information on the sampling effort that's been involved in collecting that data. So allow people to produce lists of what they've seen, give information on the numbers they've seen, but also use the phone capability to track uh, routes or enable people to produce um, areas surveyed. So we know the time that's been recorded, we know the area recorded, and we have a list of species with abundance. So I'd be really interested to know whether there's any interest in um, joining up in other parts of the world on these sorts of initiatives. And we've also got plans around Dragonfly, um, a similar tool for Dragonfly recording, this sort of timed area count concept. So the final, this is a very busy slide, so I'm not going to go into detail, but the, the other, the final thing we're doing in this area is um, a project actually uh, coming from a funding program on the digital environment but it's really trying to use um, modeling and engagement through visualizations um, and um, computer um, sort of communication tools to have a, a sort of cycle of, of um, producing a model using existing data, communicate that to recorders as to where, where their contributions would add most to our understanding. So where we're, where we're lacking information, where we have most uncertainty in our data, um, relate that to where people live and the accessibility of landscapes, for example, and then provide quite targeted, what we call nudges to recording. So um, we think you're, you might be interested in this type of recording in this place, and it will add this value to our models and then use that to update the models and, um, um, go around the cycle again. So my final slide as a sort of summary is that uh, clearly we have a huge legacy of biological recording in the UK. So, um, but I would, you know, I wouldn't overlook the fact that we are supporting, you know, we have new schemes developing all the time. So 
I guess be this, be in this for the long term. You know, what might seem a small data set or community at the beginning can grow very rapidly. Um, clearly, technology has been very important as a statistical developments. And we, we feel a lot of applications are probably best served by not necessarily raw biodiversity data, but biodiversity data that's gone through um, a review process and is curated. Um, and we're focusing on species trends and distribution species distribution models. And I also think the final thing about BLC is there is a benefit of sitting at the interface between the community of recorders, but also having links to universities. So you can pick up innovations, you can raise profile by the data being used and links to government so that um, you can have real influence on, on decision making. That, that's so thank you very much for listening and yeah happy to take some questions or if you're short of time i'm happy to move on to your other speakers thank you great uh, fantastic david thank you very very much for a uh, a wonderful presentation it's it's, uh, it's wonderful to see what uh, you know what what is happening elsewhere and what is possible and um yeah i think uh, uh, well you know, for me here involved in a number of citizen science projects, it's, uh, you know, one can one can definitely see the application that we could have uh, here in, this, in the southern tip of Africa uh, and presumably elsewhere as well. So perhaps this is, uh, uh, you know, provides an, an opportunity for people to start chatting about possible partnerships and uh, collaborations working together. Let's hope that is the case. I don't know if there are, are, are any questions. Um, um, David Thompson, um, he just says, there has BBC Click ever done a feature on apps and technology environmental citizen science? Not that I'm aware of. That'd be good. That would be a good thing to pursue. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll make some inquiries. Yeah, good. And then a question that came from the Facebook uh, um, feed is uh, from Andrew Gue in uh, Liberia. He says he'd been, he's been working uh, and collecting data on biodiversity, especially birds and butterflies, but he doesn't have butterfly guide, a butterfly guide. Is it possible that your institution has something like this, the guide to the butterflies of Liberia? No, I don't think so. We would, yeah, I guess we're one step removed from that. We often work with partners to develop the guides and then we can support them to make them available. But yeah, we haven't got any. Got any um... We must put him in touch with um, Oscar, who's done the butterfly guide to Nigeria, which I think would be useful in Liberia as well. Yes. I see there is a uh, labor and has uh, uh, asked a question. Who are your main consumers of data products? And how often do you get requests? Uh, yeah, so our data products, I guess our main consumers are the research community. So we're, because we're in a research organization, we, they're one of our main customers, if you like, or a lot of our funding is to support them. So we, we make our data products available as, as date, formal data sets that are well described and citable under a digital object and identify a DOI. Um, so they also then they also feed into governmental applications such as indicators etc and the raw data we collect typically flows as you might expect up to gbif and national nodes yeah great well thanks very much once again